Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the first webinar of Agile Data and Information Management, a short course presented by IT Masters on behalf of Charles Sturt University. My name is Guy Coward, and I'll be your MC for this webinar and for the duration of the course. Your mentor is the lovely and talented Brenton Birchmore, who I hope many of you will already know and assume that many of you already know. In any case, wherever you're watching this, we hope you are safe and well and comfortable and excited about another IT Masters free short course. Before we begin, uh, some housekeeping. All webinars for this course will be held at 7.30 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we make recordings for those who can't attend on a given occasion, but if you can make it, uh, we hope you'll attend the, the live webinars and, and contribute to a collaborative learning environment Hannah, as usual, is around tonight in an administrative and technical support role for IT Masters. Uh, she's the glue and is responsible for the learn.itmasters.edu.au website or the course page or the Moodle terms you'll hear occasionally interchangeably. And that's where you'll find all of the materials needed for this course. Uh, links to readings or to the forums if you're or to the yeah, to the forums or to the um, recordings uh, of the and links to the webinars. Um, quizzes, exams later on. If you have any questions tonight or later on on that, um, you can contact us using the details on that page. If you're having any issues, logging in, we'll be able to sort that out really quickly as well. We quite clearly use Zoom for our webinars and encourage questions uh, and the use of chat um, throughout the course and throughout all of our webinars. We ask that you direct all questions relevant to the course content to what Brenton's discussing to the Q&A section and the send all administration type questions, um, dates, times, resource availability, that sort of thing to, to Hannah in the chat. You can chat throughout the webinar with panelists only or to your fellow students as well, according to your preferences. And you can you can make you can change that setting um, once you open the drop down box uh, and open the chat log. Uh, there are usually some really experienced uh, attendees um, who sort of uh, pretty helpful with sort of entry level queries. Um, there's often some good chats about, I guess, uh, some of the theories Brenton poses and honestly debates. Um, so yeah, the insights in the chat, I think, um, augment the content significantly. Uh, we'll have Q&A sessions at the end of each webinar. Um, and if any questions are particularly relevant, I'll interrupt Brenton and we'll, we'll have a little chat about it. For those who've never taken part in a short course with us, um, welcome, thanks for joining us. IT Masters is a training organization that exists as a partner to CSU, or Charles Sturt University, who we work with to create and deliver a number of their master's courses. We also market these courses on their behalf and hope and think that the best way to do that is give some of it away free, which is what tonight is about in the next few weeks. If we do a good enough job, hopefully students will be encouraged to enroll in a, in a full master's or a graduate certificate if it suits them and if the time's right. With that said, we want this course to be useful and a, and a rewarding exercise, a sort of a standalone thing. We want you to, you know, learn some interesting stuff, have a bit of fun, hopefully, and and make some connections with fellow students and, and Brenton. To date, about 4,000 people already have enrolled in this short course, so you're spoiled for choice to who to chat with. Uh, and next week, I'll talk a bit about Charles Sturt Uni and give, give everyone an idea of what studying with us is all about and how these short courses can help you um, in completing a, a postgraduate course. So if you have any questions about um, CSU or, or, or formal paid study, um, please hold them over and I'll answer them next week. Um, if you already know that you're keen to study formally though, you can get in touch if you want. Um, otherwise I'll just have to wow you next week. Um, right, so it's time to have a, a chat with Brenton. Um, Brenton is, as, you, as we'll no doubt see in the next couple of slides, a master of everything um, <laughs> and has written most of our management courses and project management courses. And it's really lovely that he spends a lot of time in these short courses as well. So um, thanks, Brenton. How are you going? How's things? Tell us the story. Hello, Guy. Hannah. Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, I'm good. I'm really good. Um, news of the week. We got a puppy this week. Yeah. Oh. Uh, incredibly cute, uh, a cavapoo, uh, and 10 weeks old now. Bless you. Uh, yeah, it's for, 
as a companion for our 13 year old son so uh, it, he's over the moon the dog's over the moon <laughs> i'm very excited um my wife's yeah kind of on board so we're mostly good with that around here but it's yeah it's been an added dimension to our household which is which has been our big distraction this week wonderful next week uh can we please be introduced on the video sure wonderful. yes Thank we, you. <laughs> we can we can introduce you to our newest member of the of the household excellent so uh guy thanks for the intro let me go through a few things with everyone to set the scene for what you are going to experience what we're going to present to you over the next few weeks and in particular this evening this is a little different from some of the short courses we've done before where we've taken some clear methodologies things that are well established in the world and we've then tried to package them up and to be honest we've crammed a lot in to uh, some of our recent short courses this one will be at a different pace here we're going to need to build a few ideas first and then cap them off with how we can find answers to what that presents so a little bit more scaffolding this is the sort of short course that will find its way over the four weeks it's a little less episodic so each week the first couple of weeks we'll build upon it now let me first of all get my cursor where it needs to be uh we're going to the four things we're going to talk about over the next four weeks we're going to talk about decision psychology tonight this is it's not it's not going to get very heavy in psychology and for those of you who are well versed uh, well trained and well experienced in psychology uh, please forgive me in advance for how i'm going to wield that because what we're trying to do here is give you just enough of where some of these ideas come from to try to understand the end game and the end game is how best to use the information that's available in the business world today to make the best decisions that we can and there's a couple of different ways that that's being pushed at one of them is agile agile decision making agile philosophies creeping into how businesses go about well everything else not just the projects and that focus is what's going to be on next week uh, this week we're going to talk about the underlying principles of decision making and decisions and where that fits into the paradigm of decision making of agile in terms of management leadership which will then lead into how data and information management feed into that so we have the growth of data we've all known heard the term big data what does that really mean what does agile management really mean how do they work together and how do we do it with these weird things called humans that are kind of a bit fickle in the way they go about using either of those two things that's our lofty goal uh, in the four week short course that we're trying to put through the fourth week we will get into a little more detail about those more specific interactions between the way data information is used the way it feeds back into decisions we'll so we'll talk about the evolution of the dashboard we'll talk about the way in which information has a hierarchy we'll talk about the way in which those of you or people who are responsible for managing information systems can function and best design and deliver those systems in order to help the business decisions and those of you who are perhaps not delivering the information or caring for it but who are using it and leveraging it can get a bit more of an insight into how the data tools that are out there and the expectations and opportunities of agile decision making might help you with some of your decision making processes so that's our goal over the next four weeks now the contents today we're going to talk a little bit about what i mean by agility and a lot of the terms a lot of the phrases a lot of the things that we're going to cover are not always definitive there are often things that people have heard a different view or have heard a different term or different perspective so we're going to at times present what we mean or what i mean in the context of what i'm talking around that so don't mind don't worry too much if you've heard a slightly different version you often have but i'm going to be providing what is an anchor a contextual anchor for some of the other information that i'm providing we'll talk about some of the decision styles the way in which people 
often make decisions in a business, in a workplace setting. So we're not talking about all decisions or personal decisions, although, yes, there's a lot of broad application of these ideas, but we will talk more specifically about the workplace. We'll talk about cognitive bias, something that we all know a little bit about. We've all been subjected to it. Uh, we've all tackled it to some degree in our lives and in our careers, uh, but we'll nail down a few of those. And along the way, and not at the end, but along the way, we will talk a bit about how all these factors relate to information usage and management. So we'll talk about what does that mean for information systems? What does that mean for big data? What does that mean for uh, that sort of relationship? And we'll keep bringing that back as a loop as we go through all of this, because that's our running theme over the next four weeks. Now, firstly, who am I? Some of you already know who I am and may have been into some of these short courses before and listened to a little bit about my background. I'm broadcasting to you from Singapore, right on the equator, uh, where we have two seasons here, the hot and wet season and the wet and hot season, uh, which, is, which is my friendly joke about living on the equator. And it never gets old. <laughs> I love it so every you've, time. You've heard it a few times, Guy. <laughs> um, it, it, yeah, it's a bit of a staple, uh, but it's true. And these courses are being done at what is normally storm o'clock, as we often get an afternoon storm, although it came a bit early today, so it's been and gone. I was uh, born in Australia, grew up in Australia for most of my adult life. I've been in Singapore for 11 years, uh, but I consider myself, uh, because of the students that I've had over the last decade all around the world, the places that I've been, I consider myself more of a global citizen. Uh, I have prior to the last decade, I've been doing the work with IT masters in Charles State University. But prior to that, I had a number of decades in the corporate IT environment, where I had a whole range of different tasks, functions, responsibilities. And what I'm trying to do with a lot of these courses is bring all the different disciplines and ideas and perspectives together. I have done my own businesses. Uh, I, I still have two of them, uh, perhaps one and a half more accurately. Uh, 75,000 students that I've had, it's a bit, about, it's a bit out of date now. Uh, it must be getting close to, to 80,000 by now. Uh, so quite a lot of uh, students that have attended a lot of the short courses that we've had along the way. Uh, I, as Guy has said, I do write a number of the management uh, master's courses that IT masters and Charles State University operate. Uh, I'll give you a short list of those in a moment. I have got my own learning app, uh, which is a work in progress, uh, which is something that I've been building for the last two or three years. And uh, I am a, I'm a gamer. I'm a full on gamer, have been since I was a teen, which is a very long time. And I like to tell people that, you know, I've, I've probably accumulated more than 25,000 hours of online gaming time over my career, uh, which I call research. My wife calls it something else. And my 13 year old son is trying very hard to catch up. Big shoes to fill. What was the, <laughs> what was the first game? My first online game? Sure. Uh, EverQuest. Never heard EverQuest of it. EverQuest 1, the original EverQuest was my, was my first MMO. Cool. But my first game ever, when I, the first computer I had was the Atari 600 XL. And uh, we got games out of magazines in, in basic and typed them in and saved them onto a cassette recorder. Wow. And we upgraded the computer from 16K of RAM to 64K of RAM. <laughs> was... Things have changed. Things have changed. Uh, so this is the list of subjects that I've authored. Uh, we will be tapping into a little bit of the very first one there, uh, Agile. Now, uh, I want to clarify that whilst next week we will talk a little bit about Agile project delivery, I'm going to do that mostly to draw analogies and comparisons and help line things up. This isn't a short course that's going to teach you a great deal about agile project management. It's more about agile management in a more general sense, but we will certainly be touching on it to show you where it's all come from. So let's get into that. What do I mean by agility in this context? We're talking about agile management. It's a bit of a buzzword. It's a bit of a phrase that's been tossed around. It does have a variety of meanings. The meaning or the perspective that I'm coming from with this discussion is to say that agility in a business sense is about being able to make the best decisions that we can under the circumstances. And 
Agile has a way of defining what that looks like. It has a way of saying, well, what, what is the best? And if you look at where it's come from in project management, it's the same question. Agile project management is about making the best project oriented decisions, starting with what do we do next? And that's always one of the biggest, most important decisions that we make in a project. And so Agile has given us this mechanism to say, well, what do we do next? Is a little different than what it used to be when we were thinking waterfall. Now you can apply that same shift into a great many other things in business management. The idea that we can say, well, what are the tenets of what Agile philosophy brings to us? It means that we make a decision with the latest information. We'll make a decision later, not too late, but as late as we can reasonably make it so that it can get the benefit of the best possible information, best possible inputs. We make our decisions with suitable collaboration, with different people being involved, important stakeholders. We give stakeholders a sense of ownership, opportunity, inclusion, involvement in the decisions that we make. So these are paradigm changes that we can apply to almost anything that we do in business. Now, I say almost anything because there are always going to be some things that need a higher degree of forward planning, uh, detailed analysis, long-term thinking that we really do need to try and nail down now. But agility is very much natural to the human mind. It, it is our natural way of living. Project planning, the whole idea of waterfall, could arguably be said to have really matured in the 1960s. Uh, US military, the Polaris missile, some of the earliest examples of where planning and project decision making really changed. Business decision making has been changing constantly, especially over the last few decades, especially over the last few years, as our relationship with information has changed. But we humans are often inherently agile. I'll give you an example. Let's say on a day off, a weekend, we are planning to go out for dinner in the evening. The restaurant, a short walk down the road. Uh, in the morning, we might think about what we might wear. We'll think about, should we walk? Should we drive? These things will be a visionary decision for us. Not all of us, in fact, most of us will not lock in our decision. What we'll typically do is we'll wait for more information. We'll wait to see what the weather is like. We'll wait to see what our friends might be choosing to wear. Are they dressing up or are they dressing down? Then that might influence what we choose to wear. It might influence exactly when we go, how we go, how we get there. It might just influence what we have when we're there. We'll make all these decisions later when we need to. That's a natural human phenomenon. One of the other good examples is shopping. Now, if you're the sort of person that loves to take a list, have a list, look in the cupboard, see what you need, grab a list, right? You take that list to the shops. Now, that's good, but how many of us just stick to the list? You know, we, we buy other stuff. Why? Because we make a new decision on the spot. And yes, we could talk about the sales aspect and the fact that this is what the supermarkets are trying to get us to do. That's not really the point that I'm making. Point is we make those decisions in the moment and we're happy to. New input, new stimulus, new feedback, let's change our mind. So the problem with that is that business doesn't usually succeed on a whim. So business needs a different level of accountability. It needs a different level of structure. It needs a different way of saying, well, how are we gonna make sure this decision goes well? We can't just wing it every time. We need a way of recording things. We need a way of ensuring that the right information gets used. We need some kind of method to the madness. And therein lies the balancing act that Agile struggles with still, because it's not yet fully clear to all of us exactly how all this should work. So a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks are a little bit exploratory, a little bit formative. These are ideas that are still evolving in the modern workplace. But underpinning these are principles that I'm hoping many of you will find useful to understanding how you can use and leverage information and use and leverage the principles of Agile in order to enhance your decision-making effectiveness. Now this, I'm sure you will know about. I'm gonna put it all up. 
we're all somewhat familiar with the DIKW data information, knowledge, and wisdom. I want to put this up there because I want to be clear on the perspective that I'm working with when I'm thinking of these issues. And yes, occasionally we interchange the labels of data and info. Uh, we don't always choose the right word carefully when we're throwing things in. So I wanted to be clear on what we really mean or what I mean when I'm referring to these words. So often we're using information in the most part in business. And when that information is applied in a decision-making paradigm, then it becomes knowledge to some extent. Uh, wisdom is when we get a degree of consistency and we can predict and use that in advance. So just that's just a refresh of where that comes from. Let's drill a bit deeper and I want to get a little bit prophetic here. I want to get a little bit high level about what are decisions because I'm waving decisions like a flag. I'm presenting the idea to you that decisions are magnificent. They are phenomenal things, the most important things in our lives in general, in our workplace, in our careers, in everything we do, it all comes down to the decisions. So the idea I'm presenting to you is that decisions are the ultimate things that humans do. You could even argue that it's one of the primary factors or forces that separates the humans from many other creatures in this world, our ability to make decisions. So the decisions we make, everything that happens to us and for us and with us devolves from that. So it's really significantly important to us, not only the outcomes of those decisions, what decisions do we make, but if that's really important, then how we go about making that decision needs also to have an appropriate level of importance, an appropriate level of care and consideration, or at least reflection. And so the point that I'm presenting to you here is that decisions are something that are worth investing in. They're worth contemplating, questioning, considering, and thinking, well, uh, can, we can we do this a little better? Do we have more information available than I've been used to using? Do we have more people, more advice, more input? Can I work with those better than I have been? How much of my decision-making is based on habit? And how much of it is based on a knowing and deliberate technique. And can I improve that? So what comprises decision-making? What, what goes into it? I'm gonna present, I'm gonna distill all the various things that go into it into three simple components. One is the inputs. And this is where we have this inevitable relationship with big data. It's the inevitable relationship with the business environment and all of the inputs and knowledge and all of the things that we have access to, there is inevitably this ongoing flow that feeds into our decision-making. There are then the way in which our mind does things, the heuristics, the processes, the techniques, whether they be habit or deliberate or not, our mind will go through certain processes. We'll do things a certain way. We will use these inputs in certain ways depending on a variety of factors, some of which we're going to talk about in a moment. And then we have the bias. So it's not pure logic. I mean, if we just go back a step, we say, well, we have some inputs and we have some processes and out comes some answers, right? Well, yes, but we're humans. So we have this extra thing that interacts with and in some cases interferes with us getting the best, the right, the decisions that we're happiest with. So if these are the components, then this gives us the range of what we can mess with, what we can look at. If you accept what I mentioned before, what I suggested that the decision-making process is worthy of review, reflection and improvement, then these are the areas that we have available to us in simple terms to look at improving. Now in the subsequent weeks, we're going to talk about how we can improve things like the inputs when we especially talk about things like uh, data visualization. We'll be talking a lot about how to improve and manage the inputs. When we talk next week about agile uh, decision-making and agile management, we'll be talking about a lot of the heuristics. So we'll be going through some models for decision-making, some practical models for how that works in an agile environment. Today, we're gonna to talk a little bit more about the bias because that's the psychological element that is inevitably there because it's still humans making the decisions. Before we do that, 
I want to talk about one of the biggest, or what I think is one of the biggest elements of ambiguity. And then we're going to cover some styles and then I'm going to give you a poll because I'm going to give everyone an opportunity to say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to present to you four different styles of decision-making. And then I'm going to ask you to consider which one do you feel you enjoy the most. So decision ambiguity. This is the sensation that we get when we don't yet have a decision. We don't yet have an answer. We're not sure. It can be stressful to some people, or it can be a safe space for other people. What I mean by that is that not having an answer yet can cause stress for some people, not knowing. I, I just uncomfortable feeling of, I don't know what to do. I don't have an answer. I haven't figured it out yet. And that can be a stress cause for people. Similarly, though, so for other people and in other circumstances, the need to make a decision can be stressful. And delaying that decision, holding off and saying, well, I'm not going to make a decision yet, that can be a safe space because the consequences are considered to be a source of stress for us. So it can go either way. But decisions and the stress we get is usually wrapped around the ambiguity element. Yes, I'm not disregarding the fact that the scale of consequence is also a source of stress, but I'm looking more specifically at the, or more neutrally at decisions generally. We often interact with ambiguity as a self-defense mechanism. Whichever way our stress goes, are we more stressed by uncertainty or feel comfortable with it? It's generally part of the mind's intention to reduce our stress. If you look at bias, the pure existence of bias, the existence of heuristics and the way in which we go about our decision-making, a great deal of that is driven by the human's mind's desire to preserve itself from unnecessary stress. So we take shortcuts in how we do things because that eases the burden on our mind. So a lot of this, we can, we need to forgive ourselves because this is natural for us to do this. So with these shortcuts, and psychologists uh, have got a long range of, a great deal of research done over the years, and a lot of information that helps us frame and model different ways that we go about that. We're not going to go into a, a lot of those details here because this information is just a tool for us to then build upon how we're going to use that in an agile decision environment. We have our own unique version of whatever style, whatever method that's out there. They're just templates. We all have our own things. And to some extent, they're habits. And to some extent, they're deliberate techniques that we know and understand and that we've chosen. And only we can reflect and honestly answer the question for ourselves of how much of our, how we go about decision making is just habit. How much of it is just who we are? And how much of that are we just willing to accept because it's just who we are? Like we feel good about that being a defensive posture. It's, it's who I am, so I need to hang on to it, right? Well, that's not what Agile says. Agile says we adapt. Agile says we grow. We take the feedback, we evolve. Not eventually, tomorrow. So adopting the Agile principle not only within how we do things in the workplace, not only with how we do things with decisions, but how we do who we are. That's how deeply we can consider the ideas of the Agile philosophy. So we all have a threshold of what ambu ambiguity we're comfortable with. And that will obviously be a guide as to how we prefer to go about making our decisions. But our subconscious is always there. Our subconscious is always a factor. So let me give you some, a little bit of neuroscience. Okay, I promise you this is the only neuroscience that we're gonna do. Like I shouldn't make that promise. It's the only one I can think of that we're going to do. Uh, and uh, Guy, just to let you know, once we do the poll, that would be probably a good time to pause to see if we have any questions in a few minutes. Beauty, thank you. So a bit of neuroscience. Uh, some of you, I'm sure many of you will know this already. Thought, uh, it's, electrical impulses through the brain, driven by the chemicals, which is why they're imprecise. I mean, we know that with on the circuit board of a, of a computer, the, the voltages, the, the wattage, all those things are very precisely controlled. In our minds, no, it's chemically driven, so it's much more imprecise. Uh, and the number of connections is much greater as well. So thought 
is merely electrical impulses traveling through the neurons. Okay, simple point. Let's move to the next one. Focus or concentration is when the brain maintains some particular neural pathways and keeps them alive, keeps them stronger, keeps the current more consistent. It's an increase in consistency in where neurons are firing in particular ways. Right, so that's, that's focus, that's concentration. What's the rest of our brain doing? Now, this isn't exactly true, but our brain is actually capable of an awful lot more and actually has a great deal more electrical activity than just what we're currently using for whatever it is that we're concentrating on at any one moment. And we often call that the subconscious mind. The reason it's relevant here is that our subconscious mind is always busy. It's always thinking about stuff that it's, that's in our head. It's thinking about the stuff that relates to our stress. So our subconscious mind is busy making decisions, or trying to, even when we're not, or we don't think we are. We're not consciously thinking about a decision. But some part of our brain often is. So what does that mean? What does that do? Well, we, as humans, this is a natural part of our human mind. It's a natural part. And we've been doing this since we were born. We're used to it. We're familiar with it. Some of us tap into it more. Some of us rely on it more. This is where we get things like gut feeling. We get instinct, intuition. I want to create a little bit of a, a definition around this. And I, I want to pigeonhole that a little bit. Not because this is a scientifically proven definition. What I want to do is, for the sake of what we're going to go through with agile and decision making, is I want to separate these points out into a way that helps us put them in a box. So what I mean by instinct is decisions that we make in the, in the moment, quick decisions that we make. In psychological terms, what we're often doing is we're tapping into a recollection, a memory of something that was what we believe to be a, a similar decision with similar parameters that we made in the past. And we did all of the computation. We did all the thinking about it then and in between. So we can say, oh, this is just like that decision or close enough so I can come to a quick answer. And it's so fast. We know we didn't consciously go through the analysis step by step. It just popped in there. That's often what instinct does for us. Now, you look at, for example, sport. Uh, playing sport on the field, you're making a decision. Do you jump left or do you jump right? Often we do that based on instinct. And instinct isn't this strange amorphous thing. Well, I, maybe it kind of is. But it has a scientific function behind it the way the brain works. And it's simply us saying, I, this is what I think it is. So the more experience we get, the more our instincts can be honed and can provide us more useful inputs. But instincts are great when you're having a short-term quick decision. The word I use to describe the more long-term application of subconscious decision-making is intuition. So it's a longer-term response, but it's still based on inputs from the subconscious mind. Intuition is where we think we've come up with a bit of an answer, but we can't thoroughly explain all of the logical steps between A and Z. We don't know everything that went through our mind to get there, but we feel strangely confident that this is the right decision, that this is the right way to go. Often, that is to do with the way our subconscious has processed information and contributed to us a sense of comfort that this is the right way to go. Now, this is neither good nor bad. Left unchecked, applied in too many situations, it can be bad. Because business decisions don't usually, as I said before, don't usually enjoy being said, well, you know, it's like, it's just on a whim. I, I, I don't know why it's a good decision. I, I'm just, I think it's this. Hard to put a lot of respect and money behind those decisions. Sometimes we do, but not always. So these kinds of decision-making is innately human. They have a role, they have a place, even in agile environments. But in agile environments, we have one extra check and balance against these. So in an autocratic decision-making structure, one person with a bit of intuition says, let's march north. In an agile environment, you have a more collaborative input. 
you have more opportunity for different stakeholders to bring their own analysis or their own intuition or their own merging of the two to shed different light on it. But also you might say, well, let's march north, but in an agile environment, we're saying, well, hang on, we've gone north for a few days now and this is not looking like the right direction to go. In an agile environment, we can say, well, okay, the information we're getting tells us this is a new direction to go. We might make an intuitive decision simply because we lack the data. It's an empirical direction to go in. We have to go and explore. That's okay in an agile environment. When we start to go, we take the new information into account. We take the feedback into account. So this is part of how simple things that we take for granted in the way in which we process information, the way in which we make our decisions, still have an interactive role to play with agile management principles. Here's the four styles that I want to present to you. These aren't the only styles. I've just picked these four because they're very appropriate, relevant, and useful in the business environment. You can see there's two axes here, right? One is on the left is a difference between more ambiguity versus more structure, which is less ambiguity. So this is a, a, a guide as to uh, the more comfortable we are with ambiguity, the higher up we're going to be across here. This is very technical, technical task oriented, whereas this is more social and interactive. Here's the four sections that we're going to be talking about. I'm going to put the four of them up, a little bit of an explanation coming with them. So these are just words. Let me explain a little bit more. Uh, analytical, an analytical decision-making idea is uh, when you know, we want the best answer, but it's not very social. We want the best answer, but we want control over the answer. We want control over the process. We want to do the analysis. It's our thought process. And we're happy to take as long as it takes. We're happy with lots and lots of data inputs. We're happy with all of the graphs. We want all the charts. Just give me the whole spreadsheet. Don't summarize it for me. Give me the spreadsheet. Or better yet, give me access to the Perl scripts. I want to write my own scripts. Maybe. This is a decision-making mindset that says, I want all the data, I want everything because I want to make the best, most careful decision I can. And I'm gonna, don't rush me, I'm gonna take my time. And well, yeah, look, maybe I'll let you give me some input, but I'm not really interested in it because the data will tell me what to do. A directive decision-making style. Uh, this is where instinct and intuition are much more in charge. This is where it's like, Let's not waste time on a long, lengthy decision-making process. Let's make a decision and get on with stuff. We want outcomes. We want things to happen. Speed is what matters. Let's move forward. Yes, yes, I know you've got an opinion, but then this is the way we're going to go. The third one, conceptual. This diametrically opposite direct, the directive method. This is the brainstorming environment. This is the big picture. This is where you get a, a bunch of people together and say, Tell me what's possible. Let's talk about what if. It's very creative. It has no limitations. It's very broad. It's let's get all the ideas together. It's very inclusive. Get lots of input from a lot of people, but it doesn't necessarily lock things down. It doesn't necessarily create specifics. The fourth one is group oriented, but it's more about here's, here's, here's your choices. Pick one. Yes, we want everyone's input. We, we, want, we want you to all have your say. Here's your options. Choose which one. I'm about to do this to you. I'm exactly about to do that to you. I'm going to give you a poll in a moment that lets you choose one of these four. That's all the choices you're going to have. This isn't a conceptual poll. This is a behavioral poll because you're all contributing. But only the options that I'm asking for. So it wants the group input, but it's not doesn't want the group ideas and creativity clear answer, specifics. It's structural. So the directive style, I'll put all these four up. Directive, quick. It's private, it's personal, it's just me, but it's a bit closed. It's not going to take on board a lot of the data. You've only got, with a directive decision-making style, you need to get the very best, most important information into that person's head fast and first, because nothing else is going to land in that brain. They're going to be making the decision before you get to the third sentence, they've already decided. 
The analytical is the opposite of that. They're going to want more information than you'll likely get access to. The risks with the information there is the summarization process. Because what they're looking for is their own summarization. Analytical approaches have the risk of paralysis. Get lost in the data. Get Go down a rabbit hole and end up with a fanciful idea. Hello. <laughs> you being honest about something there, Guy? Uh, maybe. Conceptual has a role in creativity, problem solving, does not have a role in everyday, ordinary, simple, clear decisions. We don't get the entire company involved in little things like, do we top up the coffee machine? Behavioral, uh, we might get the company involved in choosing which type of coffee we put in the coffee machine, but we're only gonna give them a short list. We're not gonna say, hey, tell us what brand you like. We're gonna get, you know, 11 different responses. Not appropriate for that method of problem solving. So every different kind of problem, kind of question, kind of decision is gonna lend itself to particular kinds of styles and approaches. Now, the problem we humans have is that we gravitate to one of these. We like it, we prefer it. To some extent, we identify with it. We say, that's us, I'm gonna stick with that. But the reality is the style matches the problem instead of matching the human. So we need to be agile with that decision-making style. We need to know that, okay, different kinds of problems benefit from different kinds of decision-making approaches. And maybe we should choose a slightly different approach. I mean, we do, like, to be fair, we all do this, but are we doing it proactively often enough? Are we doing it clinically? Are we doing it technically? This is what Agile is going to ask you to do. An Agile management environment is going to ask you to be adept at choosing the right management, at choosing the right decision-making approach, depending on the decision. And you work within that. Can we do the poll? Please yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Uh, know thyself. Which is your favorite decision-making style? Directive, analytical, conceptual, or behavioral? What do you tend towards Brenton and Hannah, if you're interested. Now, uh, well, interestingly, uh, I have the luxury of giving a verbal answer, whereas everyone mm -hmm. else just has to pick one. This is what I meant before about behavioral style, right? You all, you all just get to pick one only. Uh, I would say that I enjoy the conceptual stuff the most, mm -hmm. uh, but outside of that, I'm mostly analytical. So I, I like the data. I like more data. I like thoroughness. Uh, I, I enjoy going through and, and making sure and double checking. I'm not a instinctive, a quick decision maker. Uh, and uh, when it comes to, when, it, when we get everyone involved, I wanna hear what they think, not just what they choose. So. I know about so everyone I, else, but this feels like the Harry Potter, which, which which house you're going to be sorted to, into. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit like that, I suppose. Huge number of analytical people in here, 60%. And, and uh, 20 for conceptual, 10 for behavioral, 10 for directive. Really interesting. So all of these styles, really useful in a business environment. We need all of these styles, but for the right situations, the right decisions. I wonder... And this is purely a hypothetical question. I, I, I wonder how much of the results we get in this poll is linked to the profiling of the typical, like the, the majority of attendees that we tend to have, the courses we tend to do. Mm. Does that mean that we have a certain demographic mindset yeah, super amongst interesting. many of our people that think a certain way? Yeah. That would be an interesting research project, which we're not doing today. I'll just have to ask this question in all of the short courses from now on <laughs> without any of the context. <laughs> uh, now, the, the, the thing that I had to talk about uh, next was biases. I'm wondering, though, before we do that, Guy, do we have some questions that are worth covering in what we've just talked about before yeah, we start let's talking about some biases? Let's have a look. One of the questions biases, is on bias. talk a bit about more practical solutions to those biases. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a couple of questions just about agile. So maybe we can go over that. Um, maybe a, a, a quick 
uh, overview of the major difference between agile waterfall from Bharat. Um, yep, but I also want to just let everyone know that we're going to go much more thoroughly into that next week as well. Uh, so don't feel that you, you're going to be missing out if we don't cover it today. We next week is much more about the specifics of agile, but absolutely we, we can we can answer those. And, and maybe we'll we'll uh, we'll go for a bit of a, a chat about instinct and intuition uh, and the way experience feeds into that. Okay, so which one's first? Let's go uh, the major differences between agile and waterfall from Barra. So I, I would start with a simple statement that says. The difference between them is we make all the same decisions, but we make them in a different order and we make them at a different time. Now to explain that in plan-based methodology, and I'll, I'll refer to it as plan-based rather than waterfall, uh, but it is kind of interchangeable. But in a plan-based methodology, you're making more decisions in advance. So what you need to do with those decisions is you need to do a higher degree of analysis in order to improve the likelihood of those decisions being good decisions. So there's more investment of time, resources to invest in techniques and processes to understand what is the best decision here because we're making it long in advance of when it's going to manifest. So this is what plans are for. This is what a project plan, this is what any kind of plan is really all about is to say, let's look at all these decisions in advance to make lots of them up front. And then what we do is we create parcels of work for people to follow where they don't need a great deal of insight into everything else. They can just focus on their little piece of work and they get that done. And if they get it done according to the plan, then later all these things should come together, you know, and, and we put all these stuff together and we get, we get Voltron at the end, right? In an agile methodology, we are much more flexible about making the decisions later. We make only enough decisions that allow us to get on with something that delivers some value, that allows us to review that to get some feedback to say, uh, what do we do next? How do we evolve this? What do we, what do we add to this? Now, this isn't completely aimless. Agile is not, you know, let's just make stuff up tomorrow. Agile still has an overriding vision. It still has an overriding strategic goal. It still has a light at the end of the tunnel. We're still aiming for something. The goalposts are there. We've tried to describe them as best we can, but if we just can't put all the details onto that goalpost, that we, we would want to do if we were plan-based, then we have to figure out the journey. We have to figure out the path. And that's what Agile is trying to do. And when you're trying to do that, you can't just rely on the decision-making of a couple of experts. You need a broader range of inputs. And this is where Agile empowers the individuals who are at the engine room of building, creating, moving this thing forward. They have a greater say. They're not just asked to do a thing and not ask any questions. We're not controlling everything by having a strict process for change. We're having a very generous, we're encouraging change because we need the change because we don't yet know enough about what we're trying to achieve. And in projects, you do that with particular kinds of projects where you can't figure it out in advance, but in an agile management environment, you often in a situation where we don't know everything that's going to happen tomorrow or next week or the week after. Most businesses' usual activity, most of it has some element of uncertainty. Some businesses, some practices have a lot more. And factory production has a, lot, has a lot less, but service delivery has more. So sometimes agile management works more in some situations than others. That's the simple definition, and we will go into more details about it next week. Beauty, thank you. Uh, we'll leave the rest of the Agile questions for now um, and maybe have a go at them later on tonight. Uh, with instinct and intuition, where does experience lie? Um, could it be either? And Christian all asks um, whether they're correct in saying that instinct and intuition become crucial in the absence of input data because we need to start from somewhere or perhaps the instinct and intuition came from previous input data, uh, which is how we use it. In the point, I think, I think all of it is at times correct. The main point I was making is the last point that, you, that you've addressed, that instinct, intuition often comes from and benefits from prior input data that we are unaware of. We're not 
we're not able to join the dots and say, that's where that data comes from. And that's why I feel comfortable about this decision. If we can't see that connection, it doesn't mean it's not there. And the way the mind works is that's what it looks for. It looks for experience and says, yeah, I've made this decision before or something like it, or I think it's like it. Therefore, I'm confident I'm going to make a decision. And some people are quicker to do that than others. And we all know people that are, yeah, like this is, this is what we should do. Yeah, I'm confident. And we all know people that are like that. We all know people that are more often, yeah, look, I think maybe, but I'm not sure. And a lot of that, some of it is due to a difference in their experience with similar decisions. Some of it is due to personality, their relationship with ambiguity. But some of it is due to that fact. How much experience do they have? How quickly can they identify and relate this decision with something previously? Beauty, if you think, thanks. If you think about, uh, well, my, my thing's just told my battery's low. If you think about, <laughs> if you think about what seniority is in the business world, what is seniority? Where does it come from? What's it all about? You could distill it back down to say, perhaps that is the single most important component of what seniority does in the business world. Why do senior people get promoted? Why, why should they get promoted? <laughs> right? A lot, of the, a lot of the time, it's because an accumulated experience of decision-making means that they'll make better decisions in the future. That's the assumption. Mm. And then there's a lot do. of other questions down here about the role culture plays, which are you know huge, how long is a piece of string? Uh, and we'll look at those later in the webinar. If I, if I drop your audio, uh, I'm going to have to switch to the big headphones. No worries. Okay, what else we got? Now, let's keep going. Let's uh, let's whip through the rest because we've got 20 questions now because people are super interested. We'll, we'll okay. have a Q&A session at the end. All right. Uh, and I'll definitely have to change my headphones at that point. Okay. Let's talk about bias because... In a lot of ways, bias is, you know, it's, the, it's the, the fly in the ointment. It's the thorn in our side. It's the thing that can do so much damage, and yet it's always there. And we know this, and many of us are working on an ongoing basis to limit the effects of bias. We can never remove it because we're humans. Only AI would make an unbiased decision. Actually, no, AI would make a biased decision because AI is often going to be initially coded algorithmically by humans setting up its parameters. It'll be a long time before we have totally self-aware AI, and then they'll have their own bias, which we'll be studying at the time. Bias is the thing that affects every decision, even when it maybe should not. So it's kind of got a dual nature to it. It's inevitable, we have to live with it, but we don't want it to have too much power. I'm gonna change my batteries, my headphones because it keeps talking when you, sorry folks, bear with me a second. I'm just gonna have to go to my Zoom settings to audio. So does this mean he can't hear us? And what can I say about him while he's away? Hope you're having a lovely time. Chuck your questions in, there's 20 going. There's about four slides left. So we'll probably finish the formal part of the lecture just a little bit later. Um, and then um, Find the right setting. you can all stick around for a fairly long Q&A. Um, okay, I'm good. Good. How are you doing? Looking look great like still. Now. No, I'm you look lovely as well, always. I'm, I can hear you again. Sorry about that, folks. It's like no technical itch. Let's look at some examples. Let's chill into some details, right? A lot of these are going to be familiar. Yeah, I've heard that phrase before. Or some of you might even find it a little bit more familiar. So, yeah, I, I do that. We all do this. We all do all of these to varying degrees. Confirmation bias. The world is full of this at the moment. Well, I guess it always has been. Look at what social and social networking has done for confirmation bias. We've got this great phrase now called an echo chamber, which is a way of describing how people operate in social circles that just reaffirms their existing views, not looking to broaden. This is the human nature. We, we look for things that validate us by looking for things that validate our view. We like that. I do that. I look at news articles that are things talking about things that reinforce what I think we all do to some extent. Yes, many of us are perhaps more curious, more aware of the need to broaden our minds and our horizons, but it is natural for us to be looking for, focusing on, merely prioritizing 
facts, data, input, that supports a pre-existing idea. What does that do if we're looking at big data? And big data is so big, it's got lots of things in it, there's more stuff that we can find that proves our point. So there's a risk here that as we introduce more and more data inputs, more and more information, more and more knowledge, that what we're doing is we're potentially creating more and more opportunity for arguments because two different people will see two different sets of data inputs that feed into their view, their perspective, their argument. So within each of us, the goal is to say, well, I can see what this does. I can see where this leads. We can have our confirmation bias when we're looking at our news articles on the internet. But when we're engaged with other people with a common goal of making our business succeed, that's a point where we need to keep these ideas in check. Group think. We've all experienced this. Uh, sometimes we've, we've been on either side of it. This is where we have the majority or believe in something, it's pretty easy for the outliers to sort of say, yeah, I just go with the, I'll go with the flow, go with the majority. Now, most of us know someone that just doesn't do that. And some of you are that one who just doesn't do that. And that's great. We, we need those people because we need that opportunity to say, is this, are we all agreeing because it's actually really the right thing to do? Or are we all agreeing because social pressure to fit in Again, it's an identification issue, right? If I don't agree with the group, what does that make me? Not part of the group? Does that matter? Is that a more important? Has my decision-making environment made that a safe thing for me to do? Or has the cultural environment of decision-making that I'm in made it threatening to me to not go with the consensus? Are we in an, if we're in an agile decision-making environment, then we are in, a, in an inclusive environment that doesn't just allow it, it wants that objection. It wants that naysayer to say, well, hang on, I, I, I have a different view. And sometimes we ask people to look at the alternative, to hunt for it, to counteract the effects of groupthink. Anchoring, one of my favorites. Anchoring is the idea that when we are thinking of a number, we're trying to estimate a number, whatever number was first proposed gets stuck in our mind and it becomes an anchor, literally an anchor, because the number we eventually might settle on, maybe not that number, but it's not, we're not going to want to deviate too far from whatever was first proposed. That's why negotiations, I want to get in first with a number. The whole point about make an ambitious claim, what, here's your number, start there, because Anywhere you go, you're moving relative to that number. And once again, if you move a long way from that number, then that makes you odd right, in some way. The human mind finds it easier to say, well, well, it's just plus or minus a little bit. Overconfidence, trusting ourselves. You could immediately say that the directive uh, decision style is one that would be more based on suffer from overconfidence bias. It's basically you trust your own data inputs more than you would trust the data inputs from others. You trust the bit that you saw, the trust the bit that you created, the report that you produce, the information on your screen more than you would trust someone else's. Hello. I did that. I did that to my son today, and he he pinged me for it. It was brilliant. <laughs> we we were looking at we booked a taxi and on the app, uh, and. I asked him, because he, he booked it on his phone, and I said, what's the, what's the registration number? And he told me. And then I made the mistake of looking to check. Ugh. I had to look at it, but, and he called me on it. <laughs> so, Love which it. I was kind of, kind of pleased with, but kind of not. Like, yeah, did it boost your confidence even more in your well, parenting? <laughs> yeah, it's a trade-off, right? Yeah. <laughs> I was caught out for doing the wrong thing, but then I had to think to myself, good on him. Yeah. And by extension, good on you. You got to grab those moments <laughs> when you can. Um, oh, just sorry. Now. Sorry. Just before you go on, um, uh, there's a very good point from uh, Tula Chan in the chat. Guy, why are you saying hello from time to time? It's not just because someone's popped in. It's because, oh, I recognize me in what Brendan has just said. Thank you. Right. I don't know. That's yes. a, 
that I don't know what kind of bias that would be. It's like an assumption about other people's uh, cultural cues. And thanks for sharing that comment, by the way, because lots of other people are going to be thinking that. And and uh, it's always good to have that <laughs> moment of, oh, yeah, 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 I'm not alone in thinking, yeah, I recognize myself in some of that. Uh, commitment bias is the sunk cost bias. Remember those situations where we made a decision before and we don't want that to be wrong. We don't want to be proven wrong. And we have an opportunity to evolve that decision. We think, oh, look, no, no, we just stick with it, right? We're just, just hanging there a bit longer. That is not agile. App, that's the opposite of agile. This is one of those biases that agile likes to beat back with a stick because agile is specifically saying uh, that decision you made before, that's null and void because this is today. And in an agile environment, this is what we're about. We're all about making today's decision because today we've got better information. We've got new information. That's the thing that lets us off the hook that says, yeah, we totally messed that up before, but that's okay because that was the best we could have done at the time or, 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 or maybe not, but it was the best we did at the time. And now we can do better and so we should. That's what Agile will expect of us. Stomp that commitment bias away pretty quick. Or try to. Did I talk about... The, so I, I haven't got back a sec. Where I talk about uh, data inputs and data effectiveness. Overconfidence in an Agile environment, we are respecting the inputs of all of the different stakeholders. Agile environment brings accountability, it brings empowerment to different stakeholders. We are expected to value the inputs of others. We want an environment that mutually supports the input of others to help counteract the fact that we're all in instinctively going to trust our own inputs more. Anchoring is a little different. Anchoring is a little more technical. Uh, anchoring is where we don't rush in with a quick number. We don't rush in with a guess. You end up with a guess if that's all you can do. If you don't start with a, I think it's 50% and then work from there. Other examples of bias, optimism. How many times have we underestimated how long a task would take? Now, science says all the time in general, we humans do that. We're par partly because we just don't think of everything that's going to happen between now and then. So you look at, you look at the, the problem with plan-based decision-making. If you're going to say, well, it's going to take me X number of hours to do this. We're going to have to think of every single thing that needs to happen during those few hours and then add up exactly how many minutes each one's going to take before we can get a realistic ex expectation. We're not going to think of all of those. We're going to miss some. So when we do that quick mental calculation that says this plus this plus this, we're going to think, yeah, probably it's just that long. Probably not. That's what the buffer is for, right? The buffer exists in our computations, in our judgment, in our estimating to deal with the optimism bias. Uh, there, there's always the other one. We, we all know someone or maybe we are someone who has the pessimism bias and somewhere in the middle, what is Agile going to do for us? Well, the great thing about Agile is that we're going to work for an hour or so. And then we're going to see how much we get done. Then we're going to see how much we think we've got left. And we're going to constantly refine the answer as we go. And we're going to be okay with that. And other people are going to be okay with that because we all know we just can't give you an answer right now. Framing, perspective, how something is presented. This is the art of the sales pitch lives in the idea of framing. Uh, you, you have uh, how something is presented, whether it's presented as a win or as a loss, something that's presented as a, a positive or a negative. There's some great research that's out there uh, that talks about how we respond differently to positive framing rather than negative framing. Uh, I think in the pre-recorded audio, I, I gave an example of where people are far more likely to choose the response that has a 75% chance of success than to choose the response that has a 25% chance of failure. And we all know it's the same. Part of our brain's thinking, I want the success bit. 
that's the very simplistic version of framing. It's, of course, a lot more complicated than that, which everybody in sales will know. There's the truth and the <laughs> truth. That's it. Truth is whatever you express it to be in the moment. Availability is, it's in terms of availability to the mind, availability to the imagination, what we can conjure up in our head and how easy it is to imagine and think about, that's more real. And therefore it's more true and therefore it's more relevant than stuff we can't imagine. And that's not how it should be. But that's how humans are. This is why we respond to ideas like winning the lottery. I can imagine winning the lottery. I, we, we all we love to imagine what it would be like to win the lottery. I can spend a lot of time picturing all the things that I would do if I won the lottery. Therefore, what does that do? It gives me an inflated idea of what are the odds of winning the lottery because it seems pretty real. The reverse is also true. When we respond to tragedy uh, and seriously negative consequences and it conjures up the fear, we could imagine something very seriously bad happening. We often think that's more likely. Simply, and that's an extreme example, but it's simply that if we can think about it more clearly, we give it more weight. Correlations, this is a very simple analytical thing. Mistaking coincidence for correlation or for causality, even worse, right? Uh, so coincidence, if something correlates, it just happens at the same time, but both things could be a symptom of something else. So we look at trends in the data, we look at the graphs and we say, well, every time this happens, this happens as well. So this must be caused by this, right? No, they're both caused by something else that we missed because we didn't look any further. And when you're looking at large amounts of data, when you're looking at graphs, it is very easy to show distorted perspectives of what's causing what. And if you wanna make a decision, you gotta look at the causes, not just the correlations. This is a form of bias that is impacting the way in which we make decisions. How does Agile help with all of this? How does data help with all of this? Well, uh, going through from the top, optimism is again helped by the increased amount of stakeholders. It's helped by the fact that, I think I've already covered that, we can evolve as we go. With framing, the big advantage with Agile is that Agile relies upon feedback from the stakeholders, the people who are gonna be affected by whatever it is we're doing, the people who are living with the consequences, it's their feedback. In project management, it's the customer. In business as usual, they will always be a stakeholder that lives with whatever the decision results in. Their feedback constantly feeding back into the decision cycle is an antidote for biased framing and for availability. Because even though we can't imagine it, they can because they're living it or they're about to live it or they can imagine the most important perspective of all, which is the perspective of the consequence. If that's not us, then that's who we need to listen to. And that's what Agile does saying customer feedback, end user feedback victim feedback. Correlation, as I mentioned in the beginning, a little bit more technical. It's, uh, this lives, the answer to this lives more in the way the information is analyzed, summarized and presented. This is the information system. So knowing this is where the people who create reports, and maybe that's us, maybe that's we're creating our own, but in the process of report creation, there are process of analysis for trends. This is where our discussion on week three about visualization will have uh, some impact. And the last one I wanna mention, this isn't all of them folks, this is just a, a, a drop in the ocean. There's dozens more. Uh, the narrative is the fact that humans love stories and anything that's presented as a story seems to have more substance. It seems to be more real. We can empathize. It hits us in an emotional way, not just an intellectual way. And therefore it affects us more. So we are more changed by that piece of news, that piece of information. So we take it into account to a greater degree. And that's a form of bias. I'm at the closing slide. How are we? 10 minutes over, are we? Goodness me. Let me do the closing slide, then we'll do some questions, Guy. How does that sound? Okay. I'm going to circle back to where I started. 
I said that I was waving decisions like a flag. I was proposing that within the agile management environment, we are going to be asked, we're going to be encouraged, we're going to be expected to get more serious with how we make our decisions. Because in an agile environment, it's all about the decision. That's the key thing we're changing in an agile management environment. We're changing our relationship with decisions, which changes our relationship with information. It is the most important thing we do as human beings is make decisions. And yet, as humans, we make them with challenges. So if the best thing we can do with our lives, in our lives, is to make better decisions, then understanding these challenges and understanding how different ideas, different mindsets can help us overcome them is, in my view, a worthy goal. And that's what this four-week journey is going to touch on. Good. Thank goodness. Um, thank you, Brenton. Uh, is, this, is this tied to a specific subject you do? It will be. Okay, great. Right here. Um, so short answer to that, no. Mm. Uh, this is to see if, and this is the, the point for, for all of you listening and watching, uh, this is a short course that we're putting out there to test to see whether or not a subject all about this uh, has enough interest in the market. Great. So do let us know. Mm. Yeah, cool. Beauty. Well, uh, as you said, we've run a little over, but that's all right. First one, um, good, to, good to lay it on thick. Um, but we have something like 32 questions. So I'll ask you, Hannah, now to start deleting questions that come in after I stop this long-winded sentence to let people press enter on their last question. Uh, otherwise, we'll be here all day. Uh, and I can't keep you back that long because Hannah will kill me and Brendan has a dog to go and play with and I should go and get something to eat. So, uh, right, yeah, we'll close the questions now. Um, and yeah, thanks everyone around for as long as you can or you want to or whatever. The decision is yours. Let's start with Jeffrey. Does corporate culture have a strong effect on decision making? And I'm just going to work from top to bottom here, Brenton. Sure. Um, yes, an enormous effect. And I guess what we're, well, I hadn't mentioned it, but what you're really is the saying is, is where it comes from. Because I've talked about agile management as if it's a thing we can choose to do. In reality, it's going to come from corporate culture. And so whether or not agile management philosophy is going to be successful in an organization is going to depend upon whether or not it becomes embedded in the culture. And if we look at cultural change, you've then got to look at all of the things that require that are required for that. Like it's got to come from the top. It's got to be delivered by example from the leadership at the top, especially when it's something to do with the distribution of power and authority, which decisions are. So yeah, this is only going to work if you are in an environment where company culture is moving in the direction of agile philosophy. Part of what this is about is saying, well, what does that even look like? Well, this is attempting to try and build that picture and build that understanding so that we can say, okay, if we're gonna move in that direction. If we want our corporate culture to go that way, here's some ideas as to how that journey might look. Absolutely, it's relevant. It's the top of the relevancy list. Thank you. Uh, okay, Nishad asks, how the cognitive biases relate to reactive and proactive management styles? And are you talking about both reactive and proactive or assuming proactive uh, in your presentations, I guess is a, an important point. Uh, it's, a good, it's a good question. I, I hadn't addressed it from that point of view, uh, actually. Uh, so I hadn't created a distinction in what we've talked about, but the distinction exists. It's a valid separation because you, you look at, if, if you take the simplistic separation, you could say that plan-based methodologies are proactive and agile is reactive, but even that's not entirely true. It doesn't really change in that way. What changes is the, the time cycle you still get reactive decisions that occur in a plan-based environment, but they are handled differently. More emphasis is placed on the proactive decisions. They are given more strength and power. And what often happens is that a greater investment is done up front in the, what if we're wrong? And what do we do to put around that? What, what sort of buffering, what sort of padding? What contingencies do we have in place in case we're wrong? And 
again, that's proactive decision making. Reactive decision making is the where we say, oh, well, you know, uh, we've, we've tried a bit of this, <laughs> we were wrong, let's be right tomorrow. And, but what you decide to do tomorrow is still a proactive decision. So it's not always a helpful distinction to make in terms of deciding how to go about making the decision. I think it's fair to say that you're always going to have them, but I think that agile gives a lot more respect to the reactive decision. Whereas from a proactive, from a plan-based methodology, a reactive decision is usually because something's gone wrong with your proactive decisions. In an agile environment, you're not expecting your proactive decisions to be that good in the first place. So your reactive decisions is where the gold really is. Thanks a lot. Uh, a few questions here about agile. Um, Andrew asks, I thought ag agility also had the connotation of dealing with rapidly changing environment, being nimble. Um, yep. Just, yep, we'll take that as a comment and say, yep. Definitely is. Uh, um, and it's, you know, you, you'll find that companies will more readily embrace agile management, agile decision-making, and all of these ideas where they need to be more nimble. And it really does depend on what they do. Like I said, if you're talking about a factory floor, you might find less need for it. Uh, there'll be other forms, like there'll be, you know, lean, there'll be other ways of adopting similar principles, but it won't be about agility in, in every case. Okay, Maria uh, says, need, need to balance agile decisions with acceptable risks and mitigation, but what is the right balance? That sounds like a hard question. Yeah, look, uh, agile philosophy says that risk management, risk mitigation is inherent in the opportunity to evolve your decisions. But uh, you, you have things like sunk costs. You do have things like um, uh, preconditions. You do have things like prerequisites. You have things that must be decided in advance because lots of things hinge upon those. So you even in the most agile of environments, you still have some things, some decisions that have long lasting uh, and expensive consequences that might have bigger risks associated with them. So it's not enough to say that, well, in Agile, we'll just fix it next week. Um, that's not always feasible. That is an inherent part of the risk management, but it needs to tie back. It needs to be able to say, well, at the vision stage, when we're not making everything clear yet, what are the risks that we're most concerned about? What's our risk appetite? What are the risks we're most worried about manifesting? We still do the same kind of risk analysis that we would do in any other circumstance, but the risk treatment might be a little different we might have a few more options with the risk treatment. And in fact, I find risk treatment does a little bit better with Agile because one of the problems with risk treatment in a plan-based environment is that they get forgotten. They get overlooked until it's big and it's hairy and it's biting you. That's when people think, oh, well, this risk has manifested. Who didn't see that coming? But in an Agile, you're really forced to see regularly how are we doing? What's going well, what's not going well? And within that, there's a greater opportunity to say, oh, hang on, there's a risk coming here. Let's, you know, nail it down now. Beauty, thank you. Another question from Bharat. Um, should decision-making in Agile projects be time-bound? Or is this something that should carry throughout the life of the project? If it is time-bound, what happens if the team is not able to finalise on a decision? So, yes, it is generally time-bound. Uh, there's usually a rhythm. And if you look at Agile project management, you have the time box. Uh, which in Scrum, it's the sprint. Uh, there's a sequence. And one of the good things about a rhythm that is a predictable rhythm for decision-making and review is that our minds get used to the rhythm. So our minds get into that curious, reflective, revisionary, how, do, how are we doing? We get into that mode at the same, after the same increment of time. And that's helpful. That's helpful for us to think, yeah, okay, uh, we've done a bunch of stuff. And during that period where we've done a bunch of stuff, we're not distracted by reviewing our decisions. We have a period of time where we can get into the zone, get focused, get on with work. And we know that there's a, a scheduled rhythm at where we're gonna stop and take a look. And that's gonna be a short scale of time that's gonna give us an opportunity to correct course. And we can trust that rhythm and we can accept that some things Sometimes waiting for that rhythm, things are going to stretch, but other times that's what it's for, is to give you focus in between 
and a predictable point which you start asking questions. And that's the value of the rhythm of the time, the time sequencing. And most companies tend to have, without that agile stuff, most companies tend to have financially based reporting, right? Uh, rhythms, quarterly, monthly, sometimes. Mm. Um, it's a similar thing, but it, you just put more decisions into the short time frames. Thank you. A couple of questions about the uh, the slide with the the X and Y axis. Um, oh. Questions about how ambiguity aligns with analytical. It might seem a little bit um, intuitive. No, no, I think I think it works quite well because um, with analytical, you know, you don't really know what the data is going to tell you until you look at it, right? Here so, it is. This so, is the slide, yeah. Yeah. So there's questions like, well, um, how does ambiguity align with analytical? Okay. Um, so let me talk about being comfortable with, think about it from that perspective. Am I comfortable with ambiguity? Am I comfortable? See, for me to spend a lot of time analyzing data for that entire time, I have to be comfortable with the fact that I don't have an answer yet. If I'm not comfortable with the fact that I don't have an answer yet, I'm going to short circuit my analysis and I'm going to go for a quick decision. So if I'm less comfortable with ambiguity, I'm more comfortable with structure. I'm going to be more directive. And so that's why it's aligned with ambiguity because where this is, a, you need to be comfortable with ambiguity to take your time. And similarly with conceptual, you need to be comfortable with ambiguity because it's like, yeah, well, whatever, what, what, you know, anything, let's put everything on the table. Whereas the structured decision is like, I, I'm only going to consider a certain amount uh, or in behavioral, it's like, well, here's your four options, choose. It's, right. it's not like everything's on the table. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think, think I think quite well, yeah. Okay. Uh, DD asked a question about uh, this time as well. Um, how do personality types fit within the decision styles? Introvert, oh. anxious, extrovert, you know, all sorts of other... Uh, inputs. That's, that's a research paper all on its own. Yeah, that one. Yeah, um, huge question. It's a huge question. I, I, I like the question because it's immediately got me thinking about it, but I, I probably look at folks. Talking. We've lost him. He's <laughs> off on an analytical bent. It would, it would, it'd be, it'd be, a, it'd be half an hour of analysis before I could come up with a, a solid answer to that. Look, I'm sure there are relationships. Uh, I don't have enough of that psychological understanding at my fingertips, at my mental fingertips at the moment to provide a solid answer. Uh, I would say that there are going to be relationships, uh, but I, I, I wouldn't be bold enough at the moment to tell you that I, how I think that would work. Uh, <laughs> introvert, extrovert, uh, that sort of stuff. I mean, you know, I'm not sure all of them that we're familiar with uh, <laughs> are going to fit because when you talk about introvert, extroverts, I mean, you'll find that... Uh, in simple terms, extroverts might be more likely to be in the people social direction because they're going to be more energized by the interactions. Um, but that's a simplistic. <laughs> Don't worry about that too much. Nick, Nick's put in the chat, trust your gut instincts and just give us an answer, Guru Brenton. <laughs> uh, actually, Nick had one of my favorite comments of the night earlier, and it was something along the lines of, um, uh, did you get those headphones from the same magazine you got your 1980s game from? Um, <laughs> Uh, so that was so, all very nice. I've I've had these headphones for so long. I was actually I actually replaced the earmuffs. Wow, that's <laughs> that's commitment. You must really that must be really good. That's a great. You can buy them. them. Audio Technica. They sell earmuffs for it. <laughs> wow. Very I good. was so and DD says yes. Dumped me. Yes. Yes. I did not have an answer for that one. <laughs> Uh, similarly, huge question, which we shouldn't spend as much time on, please, Brenton. Uh, <laughs> is the organizational culture? Uh, how is that linked to decision-making style? I imagine. I'm going to cheat and say that I've half answered that question already. <laughs> um, so I, I think that the problem with organizational culture is that it ends up being what the people in it decide it should be. And we've all heard Peter Drucker saying that culture eats strategy for breakfast. But what that means is that in the same way that our own personal human habits are going to overrule our own personal decision-making, even though we might think, yeah, I could do that better, but how we always tend to do it is always gonna win unless we fight pretty hard. And you just magnify that across a culture. Uh, one of the big advantages though, that Agile gives you 
is that it's inclusive. And what you tend to find is that the senior management people that are used to having all the power, they're the ones that are going to be saying, I, I'm not too happy about this agile stuff. And that everyone else is suddenly getting invited to meetings and getting invited to decision-making discussions, et cetera, thinking, yeah, we want some more of this. And who wins that war is what's going to determine where the culture ends up. Uh, you know, it, it's basically power versus quantity of people. Uh, and uh, that's going to be an interesting fallout for many organizations. But uh, if you can get enough people in authority to understand the business benefits of agile based management decision making, then uh, they'll be more likely to embrace it. Workers of the world unite. Yes. Uh, Tell the uh, how conceptual how is conceptual more open than behavioral so conceptual is about possibilities uh, it's about ideas it, it's it doesn't necessarily it's not strong on creating details and action plans and, and specifics it's more about uh, decisions like well strategic which, which way could we go what are the big ideas what are the possibilities behavioral is a way of saying well I, I want your opinion but only on this it's narrowing it down to say, uh, we want input from different people, but we're not opening it up to all possibilities. It's still a structured decision with structured options. It's not like, well, it could be anything we don't know, it's all very ambiguous. It's, it's you know, left or right is, is much more, but it's the group version of that. I don't know if behavioral is the best word for this, and maybe that's where it's causing a little bit of uh, loss of clarity. Uh, we probably could have come up with a better word. Uh, that's the word that this model is used, but that's that's why I'm sort of going into a bit more detail about what it really means. Uh, it, it means that we're taking the behavior of many people into account, uh, but we're not taking their conceptual ideas into account as much. Hmm. Thank you. Question from Victor. Is Scrum Agile or are they two different approaches? Uh, yes, it is. Scrum is a, a version of Agile. Scrum is a version of project ag management. So Scrum is a methodology of how to do delivery of things, uh, project-based things typically, uh, although you, you can do it for ongoing delivery if that's what you do on an ongoing basis, but let, let's call it projects primarily. Uh, it is a version, uh, a strong version of many agile principles at work and it is the methodological version agile itself is a philosophy it's way above a methodology because we're talking about agile as a broad management concept in business whereas scrum is let's just look at delivering something and probably in a project context and that's what scrum gives you whereas and it gives you roles that help you define how that who does what uh, whereas the yeah, agile is far higher and bigger and broader than that but absolutely scrum is based wholeheartedly on everything that agile believes in beauty thank you naveed asks a question how does one know which decision style to use based on a specific scenario is it is it based on past experience if so what if there is no past experience experience to draw upon and interestingly nick put in the chat um a comment just as i was reading the question uh, for the first time, it feels like if you were starting something from scratch, so perhaps no past experience, you might go concept, behavioral, analytical, directive, sort of as a, as a sort of you go through those styles to reach your ultimate decision. Uh, yeah, I probably would. I think that's, I think that's a good interpretation of how these, these styles are useful. Uh, I, I think that it's based on the parameters of the decision and uh, the consequences it's based on how clear we are it's based if it's a high stakes decision and the information is available you do the analytical if it's a low stakes decision uh, then you can go with a directive decision uh, if it's a decision that requires it's a simple low stakes decision but it does have a broad impact on multiple stakeholders you might go with the behavioral style uh, but like you said, if you really don't know where to go and you need creative input, then a more conceptual approach is more useful. So the way you would be making the decision is based on the nature 
of the decision, the nature of the problem you're trying to solve and looking at the strengths and weaknesses of each of these. And we will go into a little more about that when we talk about next week, because next week we're gonna be very specifically talking about agile management and agile decision-making. So we're gonna be looking at some practical application of matching these things up uh, and talking about solutions for that. Thank you very much. Dylan wonders, is there potentially a more favorable organizational structure type for agile projects and enterprises? Referring back to project management here with sort of matrix project-based hybrid and or functional management. Um, a more favorable structure. So I'm going to just read that point further. Okay, so matrix functional. So what, what Dylan's referring to there is some very macro descriptions of how organizations might look at their project management styles as an example and they might have a hybrid might be some things plan based some things uh, are, are going to be agile for example and uh, or, or functional where it's closely related to the business as usual component of the business etc so i think those descriptions are very uh, the large scale macro perspective of what is this company but i still think that's a valuable lens because if you shrink that lens down and look at it on a problem by problem basis, then you, you get similar answers. You, you get a thing of, well, is this thing we're doing really embedded in the day-to-day? -day? Is this problem, this question really embedded in the day-to-day? -day? In which case, maybe a functional lens, a functional approach is the right way to go. Is it something where there has a lot of early decisions that become locked in and become dependencies down the track? In which case, a degree of plan-based decision-making is going to be inevitably part of this because we can't just uproot all those costs. We have to do some analysis up front. So you still, you have that idea of, you know, here's a lens that we're saying, well, what does it look like? Therefore, what's the best problem solving approach to take? Uh, I don't think it directly translates, but conceptually, yes, you, you do have these, what's my problem look like? Uh, therefore, what should I hit it with? Sorry, just to, to, to go back to the core of the question, is there a favorable structure? No, uh, I don't think there is, uh, other than the fact that an organization that has no idea what Agile is because they've never done it and they've always been heavily plan-based and they've, done, they've kept projects and functional totally separate, they're going to struggle because it's just lack of familiarity with the, the paradigm shift. So to answer that question, yeah, the more familiar they are with agile principles, the easier they'll find this. Hmm. Thanks. Stephen asks, have you ever used analytic hierarchy protocol a la SARTI? Uh, not sure what that means, but gave it a crack. In a business context, uh, to gain consensus from factional execs to make a joint decision and remove bias. Um, I, I haven't explicitly. And in fact, that's, that's, the, that's something, that's the sort of thing that we're gonna talk about next week. Uh, and maybe I'll add that because I, I hadn't included that specifically, but we, we will, it's the sort of thing we will cover and, and I will cover it in more detail next week. I, I've not, I don't tend to use anything straight up as it is. Uh, I, I tend to modify pretty much everything as I go and, and apply it in that way. So, uh, but, you know, I, I think the great part about these, these models and these protocols uh, and the way in which you get participation in decision-making uh, they're a great starting point. And one of the good things about having official models to point to is it gives them credibility and it gives them a way of saying, we're going to do it this way that all these people have written about and all these people, you know, it's in Forbes magazine. And so there's a thing there that's got legitimacy and we're going to bring that into our organization and we're going to try it on and see if it fits. That makes it so much easier than saying, yeah, Brenton's got a good idea. Maybe we should do it his way. Doesn't usually work. So so it's there's an advantage to doing that, uh, but uh, we'll go through some of those examples next week. Beauty, thank you. Uh, just going through and triaging a couple of the questions. Do you think that organisations have or different organisations have different decision styles due to the context of the business they are in? For example, social work versus versus farming or banking. Yes, very much so, and. 
each organization has to make its own assessment as to what type of decision is applicable, how much agile philosophy is suitable to them. And I think from outside, we have to respect that. We have to say that an organization needs to make its own determination. And the only downside is that sometimes that gets overinterpreted and a handful of people who have the power to decide whether or not to let go of their power are often the ones that say, oh no, we're this kind of business. So we keep the power up here, thanks. And that can be used, overused as an excuse sometimes. But absolutely, mm. it's, it's horses for courses. You really do need to make these individual decisions about how to do it bit by bit. Great. Uh, John asks for Agile, though, do you still need to think about the same list of questions as Waterfall at the beginning? So you know what needs answering later? Yeah, actually, it's a surprising, surprising similarities between what you have to contemplate. Because mm. in an agile project, uh, at the very least, you have to decide what can we be clear on right now? And what are we not clear on? Uh, what do we have to decide right now? Like even in software, what are we going to code it in? What language are we going to use? That's an important starting decision because that's a pretty hard thing to change. Um, what database structure are we going to use? What database are we going to put it on? That's a pretty hard thing to change halfway down, right? So you get these kind of things where you really do need to at least contemplate. What you might not do is as soon as you think, okay, this is a thing that we can decide later, you put it aside. And so, but you've got to figure out what they are. So there's a certain amount of, you know, making similar decisions up front that a lot of people are surprised about when they tackle Agile because they think, well, hang on, aren't we just leaving it all the later? Well, no, there's some things that really do matter up front. And that's what, that's what the vision statement, uh, that's what the product statement, that's what the, the initial started, whatever you call the document, the initial starting point that says, well, we've thought through these things. This is what's now and this is what's later. Beauty, thank you. Speaking of horses for courses or back to horses for courses, I should say, um, Shine's wondering, or Shine says, I guess, Small to medium enterprises mostly make directive and behavioral styles um, because their business is a, a little bit smaller and doesn't need you know, too much deliberation in, in decision making, for example, having orders to approve and deliver. So how do you use agile in those businesses? Um, is, it, is agile applicable in, in these small ones? I worked in an organization that had a very directive CEO uh, and he was part owner of the business. So he had a lot of say. And um, he wasn't, well, he, he was very instinctive, but yet at the same time, he would look at a lot of information. And, but, but he would rely upon his management team to be and do the agile thing. So his, his, next layer of management was part of a structure that even though it was a small business, I call it small, like under 20 people, there was enough agility going on that the big decisions that he made that was like, well, this is the way it is. You know, he had a sign on his desk that says, be reasonable, do it my way. I put that sign on his <laughs> desk. <laughs> I bought it for him and put it on his desk. That was him. And, but he did a lot of analysis, looked at a lot of things but when he made a decision, he didn't, he didn't change course. It wasn't agile in that sense. Um, but carrying that out was very agile because he surrounded himself with people that knew and wanted and were willing to get everyone else involved and, and solve problems as they came up and not say, well, you know, you said six months ago to do it this way and now it's cost us a lot of money. He had people that, that rejected that and said, no, we're going to adapt and we're going to adapt and, and keep evolving. So there was a duality at work there that he found comfortable. And it was, every small business is going to be heavily dependent upon the style and, and, and really often the education level of the key decision makers. How much do they know about this sort of thing? Uh, and the more they know about it, the more they know what works and what helps, then often the more willing they are to embrace it. So uh, the smaller the business, the more personality is going to play a role in how much of this works and how it works. Mm. Beauty. Don's wondering uh, whether the four styles on the screen now are part of a body of work or, or framework. 
you what know, have you adapted this from, Brenton? They, they, they are. And you know what? I, I was, I just didn't get it in time. I just didn't. I, I was looking for the original source, which, of course, in mm. any internet world is hard to really be absolutely. And I did not want to put what I wasn't sure was the true source of this. Uh, so I will. I will get that for next week. And I will make sure that everyone's clear on where this came from. So you can go and look it up and do your own additional research into this because um, it's been reused and retalked about a lot. Uh, and I just need to make sure I'm, I'm actually going to the true author of where it came from. And I, if I can't do that, I'll, I'll make that clear. But okay. it, it, it's, it's something that's been talked about out in the world a lot. Beauty. Thank you. Uh, Joe wonders, can you go into how one style can translate to another? Uh, how, how does an analytical decision maker, for example, talk to a behavioral decision maker? With, with, with understanding. Uh, the simple fact that a person knows that other styles exist is a, is, is a great starting point. Knowing that well, uh, different people have different approaches to the way they do things and knowing that separating the, the issue, I'll go back to what I said uh, a little while ago, it's not about the relationship between a person and their style. It's about the problem and the style that most helps that problem. So when we separate the style from the person and we associate it with a problem instead, suddenly every style becomes legitimate. Every style has a role. Every style has, a, has its place. So there's no wrong way to do this. It's more about appropriateness. And that understanding as a starting point is a way to build a bridge between people that have different approaches and different styles. And when both people or different people with different styles have an understanding that it's all valuable and it's all useful and it's all appropriate in some circumstance, then the challenge that those two people or different people have is how do they synergize what they're all comfortable with and what they're good at to make the best decision in the environment. And that's collaborative and that's agile. But it begins with understanding and respecting that the differences are valuable. Thank you. Um, we're already 45 minutes over, so I've cut a few more questions. Um, we'll, we'll just go with a, a couple more. Uh, and I'll quickly answer, uh, are there any strategies? This is Perb IT, IT, IT Masters team. I know how to say our name. No, and personally have used to help deal with people's biases. Probably, I'm not sure if about them. <laughs> um, maybe Brenton should answer that one actually, that's too glib. Um, and pot potentially with your assessment marking, Brenton, how do you deal with people's biases? Um, or is it more about dealing with your own? It's dealing with my own. Is, is the bigger issue because the business we're in is knowledge. The business we're in is the pursuit and the demonstration, the acquisition and demonstration of knowledge. And knowledge, how it's expressed is only one snapshot of how it's actually understood. And so when you're assessing something, you have to be able to separate the idea that the way it's expressed is just an example of what knowledge that person has. And so you have to find a way to infer from that uh, what knowledge they needed to have in order to have expressed whatever they've expressed. And if that's how you're assessing it and that's what your goal is, then when you present knowledge to them, the, the, the actual act of teaching is trying to present things with enough neutrality that it can penetrate whatever bias a student might have whatever perspectives they might have and be neutral enough to, to sort of sneak under, over, past or around anything they might be, might, might preconceive. You rely and trust on the idea that as a, a willing student, that they're open to that process. But as an educator, uh, that's your primary goal. And on the, on the return part of that is you need to then find the knowledge without the interpretation mattering too much. So marking is a constant exercise of diluting bias out of your own thoughts. And like you, many of you would have studied and, and had the problem of saying, well, you know, that's, you've said the right stuff, but not in the way that the marker wanted you to say it. 
uh, and you lose marks for that. Well, it, that's not necessarily the student's fault. And I think we're going to go in trouble. There's someone's in trouble now because everyone's going to say, oh, I've got something to complain about. <laughs> but it's exceptionally hard to do as a human riddled with bias because it's not that the market doesn't want to see the knowledge. It's that they have to be able to find it. They have to be able to, and this is the hard part, you have to be able to imagine many other ways of constructing that knowledge and then try to understand what of those methods of constructing that knowledge did this student just present to you and then reward that. So bias is tangible, hmm. in, in, but no, no more tangible than any other business because any other business out there when they make decisions, there's going to be far reaching consequences for the people involved or, or their customers. You know, where, where bias impacts a decision. Beauty. Thank you. Two last questions. Uh, thank you for the 250 folk that have stayed behind. I hope you've enjoyed it and it's been worthwhile. Uh, Luke, I've worked in both waterfall and agile environments. I feel that the many people in agile and that, that many people in agile environments don't understand that a standard systems engineering methodology for requirements definition is quite similar to product descriptions or vision statements. What's your experience with these views, Brenton? I feel both are meant to be open and outcome-based without reducing the freedom of action of the project team. I think that's a, a great philosophical position and it's a huge thing to unpack. It's the sort of thing you can you know, chat about by the fireside for a long <laughs> time. But to try and distill that down into a simple answer, I, I think that what happened is that with too much whimsical stuff going on a few decades ago, project management came into its own, requirements definitions came into their own, business analysis came into its own, uh, they needed to control, ex stuff was expensive. And Agile evolved out of the need to meet growing, evolving needs. Agile partly evolved out of the fact that the technology could do more things now. And figuring out what we needed it to do was had many more answers than it ever had before. So Agile was a way of not just finding out how do we make this work? Agile was a way of finding out what do we really want? Because until we see what everything can be done, we might not even know what we want yet. And so it was a reaction to some extent, the existence of Agile. Whereas what I think we're heading to is a merging of these concepts and principles where uh, exactly, I think, as Luke is explaining, uh, there's not a lot of differences. But Agile has presented itself as being new and different and exciting because it, it wants to be a bandwagon that people can jump onto. It wants to be exciting and new and different. So it's kind of positioned itself as being, hey, we're, we're way out here on a limb, whereas in reality, there's a lot of similarities and there's a lot of common ground and there's a lot of middle ground. And I think, I think that's where Agile management is sort of starting to become a new middle ground where we're saying, look, it, it's not about are we all plan-based and waterfall? Are we all agile? It's like, what's today's problem? And what's the best method for that? And when we get, but you could argue that just doing that, just saying that makes you agile. Ag agile proponents would make that argument. But I agree with what I think Luke is saying that that's just the objective truth of where efficient application of decision-making is going to be in business. I think that's where we're headed. And that's why I think that's why I'm doing this short course. And that's why I think that this kind of knowledge is useful in the workplace. Thank you. And thank you, Luke. Uh, Jeffrey, last one for the night. Would you say the decisions various state governments make, I'm not sure how on top of uh, Australian state governments uh, decision made, decisions uh, you are, Brenton. Um, but would you say that decisions various state governments, and if not, if you're not very familiar, let's just say states generally make to address COVID outbreaks and clusters is a reflection of agile decision making? Well, thanks, Jeffrey, for finishing us up on a political question. <laughs> it's a it's a powerful way to end the evening. I think, in some cases, yes. I think it has presented the world with uh, presented governments around the world with 
opportunities uh, to implement agile decision making because it is a fast, very fast changing thing. It is one of the fastest changing threats outside of war that many governments around the world have faced in recent times. And it's so set up for it's so it's so appropriate to have many principles of agile at work. But having said that, you also have the problems of lead times. Uh, you also have the logistics problem of the whole idea with the vaccine creation. Uh, you, you can't, well, yes, there's a certain amount of agility in that too, but you can't distribute you know, millions of vaccinations to a population without a degree of plan-based methodology at work. And so you can't agile everything. And I, I think that how well they've done it, some have done it really well, some have done it really poorly. And I, and I think that if you look back on it in the future, I do think there'll be a lot of things that are saying, well, these decisions were stuck in a non-agile mindset and were not sufficiently adaptive to the situation. And I, I look at where I live here in Singapore uh, and I see a lot of examples of agile decision-making where decisions are made fairly quickly to respond to things. I look at what happens with the snap lockdowns in Australia. Uh, and whereas Singapore will make a decision for the next four weeks, Australia will make a decision for a number of days in a localized area. It's a very different approach, but they're both trying to do what works for their organize, for their environment, for their situation. And not always successfully. If you look at the vaccine rollout and distribution, uh, it's not fair to make a comparison because you know, Singapore is an area the size of northern suburbs of Sydney. Uh, it's pretty easy to roll out something into that geographical area in comparison. But I think that there's a lot of lessons being learned by decision makers uh, about how to do this better. Uh, and I think that agile and agile decision making in general uh, is the sort of thing that uh, a lot of organizations have had to evolve in. Look at, look at what education has done. Look at the number of schools that have had to cope with, you know, one week we're in class, next week we're at home, next week we're in class. Uh, how do you deal with that without an enormous amount of agility? And perhaps if you're looking for silver linings about how our world has changed, perhaps hopefully some of us have, have gotten a little more comfortable or a little better at agile decision making because of how it's helped our lives in some situations. Thank you. And thank you for ending on a lovely, positive, optimistic, hopeful point, Brendan. Excellent. Heavens above, uh, some 70, 70 odd questions. Um, wow. Big. The night. Um, thank you so much, Brenton. Uh, thank you so much, everyone who listened along or is listening along or stuck around for as long as they did. Just thanks for getting involved. I love these short courses and it's always a pleasure to bring them to you. Uh, thank you, Hannah, for making it possible and um, uh, being the glue that holds Brenton and me in place. Uh, Brenton, as ever, pleasure. Uh, thank you so much. Look very much forward to meeting your dog next week. That will be item one. Um, keep things going in the forum, folks. Uh, any questions that you wanted to ask, but I cut off or I didn't answer, um, chuck it in. The forums are great. That's where you can really continue and flesh out a lot of these things. We can't explore too much in, in a webinar form. So, so go for it. You've got a month to, to think of fun ways to engage. Um, next week we'll be talking about agile, won't we Brendan? Yeah. Agile management. And, uh, as I alluded to earlier, uh, this is a, this is an agile experiment for us. This is like, should we do more of this or not? So more than usual, let us know what you think of this course because we will take that feedback and feed it into the decision-making uh, of what courses we create in the future. Beauty. Yeah, look forward to it. Thanks so much. I'll leave you to sign off. All right. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you everyone for all of your input, your questions. Thank you, Guy, for guiding us all through it. Uh, and uh, thank you for all the great comments. Looking forward to seeing you all next week for the more of the same. Until then, that's all from me for now. Thank you and good night.